Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to the March 15th, 2017 Lunchtime Hot Topics. This happens to also be the day we are having the Wednesday State Board Meeting. There's been a lot of good things on the agenda this month. Um, but as we move through the Lunchtime Hot Topics, we have a, a few items we want to update you on. The first one being kindergarten readiness. Tammy Mitchell will be giving you an update on that, um, which just happens to be also the state board um, just finished having a retreat this morning on the kindergarten readiness. So Tammy will be able to give you an update on what the board was looking at as far as what they want to do as a state, what kind of uh, instrument would they like to have school districts administer, what they would like to collect is around kindergarten readiness. Uh, but more importantly, once we know where we have districts that have large populations of students showing up to kindergarten not ready, what can we do to help provide supports on that? So uh, that'll be a good update by Tammy. We also have a, an update by Diana Stanfill. She'll be talking about the new federal IDEA parent survey. Just giving you an update, a little bit of history, a little bit about the survey. So um, again, that is something new that is a collection for uh, the federal IDEA component. And then Jessica Noble is going to give you an update and just for a lot of people might just be a new introduction to the Kansas Volunteer Commission. Um, the AmeriCorps planning grant be a great opportunity for um, districts to get involved with. I also want to remind you that if you have future topics, you have questions, please send those to lunchtime at ksde.org. And I also wanted to let you know that on our agency website, if you go to ksde.org, and then hover over agency and then click on division of learning services scroll down to the lunchtime hot topics and you can see um, a chronological list of all the lunchtime hot topics we have uh, they are recorded you can play them again for for staff or administrative or leadership teams just on different topics and it tells you what we covered on those. So anyway, if you would like to uh, show these at any other time, that's where you'll find the complete list. Also want to remind everybody that coming up this summer we, at three different locations, we have our Impact Institutes. The theme this year is Kansans Do. This really focuses on the state board initiatives, what's going on around the board's vision, You'll get uh, much more in detail around individual plans of study, kindergarten readiness, social emotional character development, post-secondary measures. And you can see on this, there are three locations, Washburn, Pittsburgh, and um, Barton County Community College. Would really like to encourage you to send a team, especially teachers. That's why we do this during the summer provide teachers the opportunity to uh, come together, listen to some of the individuals that are leading these initiatives, as well as we have a lot of school districts that come and present to share what they're doing in their own school district. So again, it's a very low cost. I think it's only about $25, $30 uh, for the two day, but those are great opportunities for especially your teachers or other staff that haven't been able to get plugged in to the initiatives and where we're headed. Again, we're excited just to uh, continue moving this vision forward. We believe that uh, Kansans can do this. I'll be uh, heading to DC this weekend to have a um, discussion for a few days with the deputies from all the other states really talking about what are we trying to do just out, outside of federal accountability? 
under ESSA. What are states doing trying to uh, uh, change the vision, change the focus away from just a standardized test score to other ways they're trying to measure student success? And, and tell you, I'm, I don't know of any other state yet that is trying to really change the conversation and happy with where we're at here in Kansas and appreciate you being on board with us. Thank you. Hello, I am Diana Stanfield with the Early Childhood Special Education and Title Services team. And I am here to ask for building level help with the federally mandated IDEA parent survey. First, I will briefly talk about the survey and process, and then I'll lead into how principals and other building level staff can assist in increasing our participation rate in the survey. As I go through, jot down any questions or comments you may have, you will find my contact information on the last slide. I will read the specifics on this slide so you have the exact purpose of the survey. IDEA federal requirement to survey parents to determine the percent of parents with a child receiving special education services who report that schools facilitated parent involvement as a means of improving services and results for children with disabilities. As I stated, the survey is federally required and the questions on the survey have been validated and um, checked for reliability by the federal government. I'd like to talk to you uh, briefly about a couple of the details of the 2017 survey. This year is a census year. It uh, comes up once within each six year cycle. So every parent of a child with a disability who has an IEP will receive a survey um, notification letter. And uh, when we say with a disability who has an IEP, that is as of our current December 1 count. So if you have a student who is identified more recently, the parent will not receive a survey. KSDE does not have parent addresses, therefore the parent notification letter is mailed by the special education director. The notification letter directs parents to an online survey. And this year, the census count was over 71,000 Kansas parents sent a survey notification letter. And normally the count is closer to 2,500 to 3,000. This is what I am asking your help with. To meet the Kansas Parent Survey Results target and participation rate, we are requesting your assistance and reminding parents to complete the survey. Similar to what I did last year um, in late March, early April, um, I will send you as the principals a sample text. If you would please include that in your newsletters, any letters, text messages, or email blast if you have the capability of doing so. The sample text will remind parents who received a letter to complete the survey. We do not provide the survey link in the text because survey participants are restricted to those who received a letter. This has to do with having accurate numbers to track participation rates and the results. This is a quick timeline of events, um, just an overview so you can see where your assistance falls in the overall process. As you can see, March 1st, uh, we sent the notification letters to the special education director. The um, notification letters were to be mailed by April 1st. And then late March, early April, I will send uh, some sample text to um, have you send out those reminders in your newsletters, emails, or texts. And May 31st is when the parent survey closes. Um, I would like to just briefly go through this. It's a little confusing. Um, the survey is online and the letters that were sent to parents are only notification letters so that they can go online and take the survey. That is why uh, the URL will not appear in any of your reminding texts. So I wanna thank you for your assistance with the Federal IDA Parent Survey. Your help is truly appreciated. And below is my contact information. If you have any questions or comments, I am Diana Stanfill at dstanfill at ksde.org. And my phone number is 785-296-7262. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Tammy Mitchell. I'm an assistant director on the Early Childhood Special Education and Title Services team here at the Kansas State Department of Education, and I'm here to give you an update on kindergarten readiness. We have an early learning team here at the State Department of Education and I just wanted to take the time to introduce those people to you because um, all of the work that we're doing involves a huge team effort. And so uh, Barbara Dale is an early learning consultant on our team. Um, I am an assistant director. Vera straub rontier is an assistant director. Ryan Weir is a fiscal consultant. Ms. Wilbur um, is our newest team member. She is an early learning consultant. Dean Zeitz is our, our fiscal coordinator and Colleen Riley is our director. All of the work around kindergarten readiness and, and early learning um, to date has been carried mostly by this particular group of people um, and we expect to bring more people on board as we move the work forward. So our objectives today are to talk about early learning in Kansas and then give an update on um, a pilot that took place this fall and, um, and some of the, the comments and conversations that are taking place around um, that kindergarten readiness snapshot pilot. So just as a frame of reference, I wanted to show you this graphic because you can see that kindergarten readiness is one of these results. Um, outcomes, measurable outcomes with post-secondary completion, individual plans of study, social emotional growth, and high school graduation. And those are um, what are being referred to as results. But the evidence-based practices that impact these results can be found in the four R's under um, the Kansas Education Systems Accreditation or KESA. So when we're talking, <clears throat> when we're talking about kindergarten readiness, <clears throat> we're not talking about it in isolation. We are talking about it within this framework. And you can see that early childhood is, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the responsive culture, but um, other components would also feed into kindergarten readiness, including um, relationships with families and communities and staff, curriculum, instruction, student engagement, nutrition and wellness, um, professional learning, all of these components, these evidence-based practices um, impact kindergarten readiness. And the reason we are concerned about kindergarten readiness is that when, when we have strong kindergarten readiness, we have individual plans of study, we've got social and emotional growth, that will impact the high school graduation rates and post-secondary completion so that we have the successful graduate. So why are early learning programs crucial? Um, here's a resource here for you, but here are some, some highlights. Children at risk who do not participate in high quality early education programs are 50% more likely to be placed in special education, 25% more likely to drop out of school, 60% more likely to never attend college, 70% more likely to be arrested for a violent crime, and 40% more likely to become a teen parent. So um, these are facts in the from the Kids Count data book. And so if we really are talking about the successful high school graduate, then we really cannot ignore what's going on with our littlest Kansans before they ever come to kindergarten. So ever since kindergarten readiness became a board goal, there have been a lot of really interesting conversations taking place around the state. Um, we've had the opportunity to be a part of district conversations and community conversations, um, and more and more people are really getting excited about this particular outcome. But one of the, the some of these big questions that you may also be thinking of are, would, are around, well, how can schools be ready for the children they receive? What is a high quality early learning experience? What does quality kindergarten look like? And how do we align early learning to what's being done in K-12? So these are big questions. These are questions that each community has to grapple with um, independently. Um, we're happy to listen and have conversations with you, but 
um, as you know, districts are so diverse in our state, and it wouldn't there isn't a one size fits all. But if you're talking about you know what kinds of questions should you be asking in your community, and this is a pretty good list to start with. So we're working here at KSDE to align um, birth through K-12 in as far as having a coherent birth to elementary framework and aligning standards, curriculum, and assessments. So I wanted to share this with you, and this is another really good resource. NAEYC, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, um, has just a lot of really good resources about developmentally appropriate practices. Um, and so when, when we're talking about schools being ready for children, we're talking about developmentally appropriate practices. Um, knowing about a child's development and learning, knowing what is individually appropriate, and knowing what is culturally import important. So, um, you know, there's some misinformation around um, what it, around developmentally appropriate practices. Um, some educators, when they hear developmentally appropriate, they think that it means that it's not rigorous or that it's not aligned to standards, and it, that could not be further from the truth. Um, so I really encourage you to um, explore the NACI website, um, and if you want additional resources about developmentally appropriate practices in kindergarten, I would be happy to share some of those with you. So here we are all Kansas children ready for kindergarten. And what we have here is an aspirational goal. Each student enters kindergarten at age five, socially, emotionally, and academically prepared for success. So this is our goal. Some, we will get there. Um, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a measurable goal. It's not something that we can accomplish as a state in a year or two. But um, imagine for a minute when this is true, and every five-year-old comes to kindergarten socially, emotionally, and academically ready, what does that mean for our educators? Um, how would kindergarten look different? Um, I think our kindergarten teachers could probably um, ex you know, explain that and imagine that. Um, what does it mean for students? What does it mean, mean for children to come to kindergarten and be socially, emotionally, and academically ready? Uh, it might mean less tears. It might mean less behavior problems. It might be, uh, it might mean more confidence. Um, imagining and talking through these questions with your staff and your community can be really powerful. And then what does the goal mean for their families? If children are ready at five, what has happened um, positively to families to, um, to get them there? So this is what we're shooting for. I mean, it, is, it is a moonshot, and it will take us a while to get there, but, but it's important work, and we're starting, we've started it a year ago, and the work continues today. So how are we going to get there? How are we going to get to this aspirational goal? The starting point, just the starting line, is to have consistent statewide data for decision making. That is our first step. So we've had this kindergarten readiness work group um, who has worked together for well over a year. And I want to, and we've had um, the core group has stayed the same. We've we've added a few new people and um, and a few have moved away. But I wanted to share this with you because this work um, has been in partnership with um, different state agencies, uh, different school districts of various sizes. Um, experts from um, student support services, from education cooperatives from Kansas MTSS. Um, we've had our English learner and Title III um, expert here at KSDE part of this, um, and, and of course our team. So I just wanted to show you that, that um, the work to date has been a group effort, and it's included our team here internally as well as stakeholders from around the state. So we're going to talk about a snapshot. Um, a year ago, our commissioner, um, Dr. Randy Watson, made a video where he talked about a kindergarten readiness screener. 
And what we're finding is that um, that seems to be a really big hurdle. Uh, people can't seem to get past um, the the mental image that a screener is supposed to keep kids out of kindergarten. And that is not at all what we're talking about here. So we've taken the word screener out and we want to ha have everyone think of it as a snapshot. It's not a test. It's not an assessment. It's a snapshot. And so um, the ages and stages questionnaire three and the ages and stages questionnaire social emotional two um, just this just lines up simply the difference between what we have piloted versus a more comprehensive assessment or test. So the ASQs look at developmental milestones, whereas an assessment or a test looks at skills acquired. Um, it was very important for us to look at developmental milestones because we don't have early childhood opportunities or preschool for every child in our state. There are not near enough spots with our partners at, at Head Start, with um, faith-based preschools, with KSDE and Children's Cabinet um, programs. There are not enough spots. So to look at skills acquired would not be realistic for where Kansas is at this time. So we're looking at developmental milestones. It provides a snapshot. So um, like a lot of other um, uh, snapshot type tools, it's just kind of taking the temperature. Where are they on this particular day? And does that snapshot look like they're developmentally on track? Or does it look like maybe more in something more comprehensive is needed? An assessment or test jumps right to uh, something that is much more comprehensive. The ASQ3 and ASQSE are relatively brief to administer, and we'll talk about that. Um, each form um, really takes about, can take 15 to 20 minutes once people get used to um, how to collect that information. Whereas an assessment or test is uh, lengthy, it requires um, time, it requires time away from the classroom to, to administer it. And then the ASQ3 is largely observational in nature, whereas the assessment or test requires pulling kids to the side, asking them a lot of questions, um, and trying to maneuver and manage um, that. So, so this kindergarten readiness snapshot is a hinge. Think of it like a hinge, not a gate. It swings back to inform teachers of prior experiences. It can swing forward to inform effective classroom practices. And that's how it can be used at the local level. At the state level, all we're collecting is the number and percentage of students who arrive um, developmentally ready for kindergarten. That's really all we're looking at at the state level, but we wanted to want to provide a tool that provides rich um, information to local programs. It can inform communities regarding early childhood opportunities, but it is not a gatekeeper to screen five-year-olds out of kindergarten. So we want to get to our aspirational goal of arrive at five. So here's the ages and stages. I'm going to talk a little bit about the pilot. If you want to know more about the ages and stages questionnaires, you can go to agesandstages.com. There is over 20 years of evidence and research behind this particular tool. Um, it is valid and reliable um, when, when implemented with fidelity, and it is a parent-completed child monitoring system. That means that it's a questionnaire for parents. So we'll um, talk about that. Um, I know that everywhere I go, everyone asks, well, are parents reliable? Can, can we trust them? And the research behind ASQ is so strong that um, they can prove that 90% of the time, the way a parent reports a child's development and the way their teacher would report it, 90% of the time they are in agreement. Okay, so that's really, really high. Um, you know. Of course, 10% of the time, it's not. And so we will have um, to think about what happens when, when a teacher and a, and a caregiver or a parent are not in agreement. So the ages and stages questionnaires, this just tells a little bit about them. So the ASQ3 measures communication, which is you know early literacy um, and verbal skills, gross motor and fine motor, 
problem solving, which um, includes early or emergent math skills, um, language skills, and um, science skills. And then the personal social, which would be what we would think of as self-help skills. The SE goes uh, into more social emotional um, characteristics. Um, how well can children regulate emotions? Um, how well do they interact positively with others? And is their area, are their emotions and interactions developmentally appropriate? So I encourage you to check it out on agesandstages.com. So um, I think possibly when this particular Hot Topics airs, um, I may actually be presenting data to our State Board of Education. Um, we are to be presenting on March the 15th, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of information, but our board is going to be getting quite a bit more information um, that I will be able to update you on a, at a later date. So our pilot included 189 teachers in 62 schools. Um, 2,222 questionnaires were given, and 2,641 caregivers or parents were um, included in this pilot. The participating districts, there were 37 total, um, all sizes from 1A to 6A, um, all over our state. So it was a really nice representation. And so here's our snapshot implementation timeline. And all of this is asterisked because it is still in flux. It is still to be determined. I could come to you two months from now and have a timeline that maybe shifts or, or looks a little different. But our first step this spring is to present a recommendation to our Kansas State Board of Education. Um, the State Board has um, some decisions to make, but re based off of this, this decision, um, we would, as an agency, engage in a request for proposal process. Um, that is a state requirement. It ensures that we are good stewards of our state dollars. And so we would put out a request um, to see what vendors are out there that can provide um, a tools and support to our specifications. A vendor is selected through a very rigorous um, process and contract negotiations take place. So you can see that before we ever order materials, there is um, a lot that needs to be discussed here, okay? Now, our goal is, you know, if our state board um, approves the use of the ages and stages questionnaires, our goal is to find funding so that this would be at no cost to schools. That is our goal. Um, depending on, there are so many things in flux, there are some so many dominoes that need to fall that um, I, I'm, I can't promise that, but we're working very hard to make that a reality. Um, best case scenario, this summer we would be ordering materials and shipping them to every elementary school in Kansas, and that, and a training of trainers would begin. Phase one, this is, this is really important because I've got so many people calling me saying, you know, if we're supposed to do all of this in the fall, where are we? It's March. And we've, we need to roll this out really intentionally. And so our goal is for it, during the fall of 2017, we would have a phase one training. So our idea is to um, have a, a large cadre of train, trainer of train in a trainer of trainers cohort, and then to disperse those trainers back to their home districts where the first phase of training would begin. And I anticipate phase one being, you know, how to, how to collect the data, um, ideas on how to engage parents, how to enter the data or get the online pieces set up, and really having time for every um, classroom in Kansas to have the same experience that the pilot had and in, in that you're trying out the tools, you're trying out the online pieces without the pressure of having an actual data collection. So that would be in the fall and then in the spring of 2018 the phase two training would include um, here are the reports that are available at the local level, here are the results, here are some tips and for talking with parents about the results, what do the results mean, what do they not mean, and really making sure that before a data collection begins in the fall of 2018, 
everyone knows the tool really, really well. They know the online pieces really well and they feel confident and equipped to talk to parents about the results. So I'm just going to say, don't spread fake news. Um, why believe a rumor when you can have the real scoop? We've got some resources here. The Kindergarten Readiness Fact Sheet um, is on the Kindergarten Readiness page. And I, I'll see if I can link to that right now. So um, if you go to ksde.org and there's an alphabetical index across the top, click K for, and then select Kindergarten Readiness. And um, we've got a kindergarten readiness fact sheet just freshly updated, um, has some of the information that I shared with you today and the updated um, kindergarten readiness snapshot timeline. So it's a one pager, it's super quick, it's super easy. If you wanna go in a little more depth, we have an FAQ for teachers and administrators on that same page. And it is, it is quite a bit lengthier and it has more information regarding the uh, the pilot, the ASQs, um, and it's in it's in a question format. So here's some frequently asked questions and links, and um, and it is quite a bit longer. So that's why I said it's really for teachers and administrators. Probably too detailed to share with parents. But the the fact sheet that I showed you previously would probably um, be a really good resource for um, your community members and your parents. There is a kindergarten readiness listserv. If you want the latest updates, um, we will send it out through that listserv. If you're interested in being a part of that listserv, you can email me, Tammy Mitchell, tmitchell at ksde.org. And then also, um, when you hear uh, rumors or fears that don't align with these documents and don't align with what I'm telling you today, um, please point people in the right direction and if and if you're unable to to point them to the right resources here please don't hesitate to have them contact me um, the number here is my direct number at KSDE 785-296-7929 and my email is always available so um, so that's all I have for you today um, thank you for your time and don't again don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions um, thank you and have a great day. Hi there, good afternoon. This is Jessica Noble with the Kansas Volunteer Commission. I wanted to talk to you today about our AmeriCorps state planning grants. So I am the executive director of the Kansas Volunteer Commission. That's me there in the middle rocking that uh, horrific, ugly Christmas sweater. Uh, that picture was taken in July, by the way. Uh, I wear it year round. And the Kansas Volunteer Commission is housed inside of the Department of Education. We offer a multitude of grant opportunities of which we have several of our school districts that have taken advantage of those. And we also manage the AmeriCorps State Program here in Kansas. The Kansas Volunteer Commission, we have a mentoring partnership as well called Kansas Mentors. We have the AmeriCorps Program, which I just talked about. We also fund a STEM mentoring initiative through our Volunteer Generation Fund, um, and a shout out to Baster Linwood and Olathe, who have, uh, their districts have a, a program. We also have many grants that are available, both for the 9-11 Day of Service and for the Martin Luther King Day of Service. So if you are interested in either of those mini grant opportunities, maybe you're interested in incorporating um, some civic engagement or service learning into your district, those would be a great grant opportunity up to $750 that you could take advantage of. At the end of the webinar, I will have the email address that you can send your email address to if you want to be added to our newsletter. And that would be the best way to be in the know about all of our grant opportunities. But today we're going to talk about the AmeriCorps program. So we have eight AmeriCorps programs currently in our state and those members are providing direct service. They can do that in a multitude of different ways, uh, either full-time, half-time, quarter-time, part-time. We have a reduced half-time. We have a minimum time. Um, so there's a lot of different hour configurations that they can be serving in. The focus, though, is really on your local community and the needs that you have. So today I want to highlight a program that's in KCK. 
KCK Public Schools has um, kids zone programs. They fund with their 21st century after school uh, money. And they also have an AmeriCorps program. So they're supplementing their staff that are in those kids zone programs with AmeriCorps members. And they, those members are serving for 900 hours in the district, providing mentoring and tutoring opportunities to their uh, most disadvantaged students. So it's a really great way that the school district has used the AmeriCorps program to stretch their resources and to serve even more students. You must have at least five AmeriCorps members in order to operate a program. So I know for some of our districts, it will be really difficult for you to find enough service for five full-time members to do. And so we also wanna encourage you, as I get to talking here about the planning grant, is to think about ways that you can partner with other neighboring districts, or maybe ways that you can approach your service center to see if they would like to be a multidisciplinary hub and then they can have members that are placed in multiple districts across the state. Uh, there are other states that are doing this with great success and I would love to see us bring something like this to Kansas. Our funding priorities fall into these areas. I know that most of you will probably be focused on education. Um, you might want to focus on economic opportunity if you have a number of adults in your district who are without a diploma. That'd be a great way to um, help raise the collective health and well-being of your community by making sure that they um, are able to earn a diploma. You might also be interested in focusing on healthy futures. So you might want your AmeriCorps members um, to serve in the summertime, perhaps. So maybe you're going to do a blend where AmeriCorps members might serve as mentors and tutors throughout the year. And in the summertime, they're helping to staff your um, summertime lunch program. So that would be another way that you could use an AmeriCorps member in your school district. There are a number of benefits to the AmeriCorps members. They receive a living allowance, and so that breaks down to about $1,000 a month, uh, which doesn't go very far in our urban areas, but might go pretty far in, in a rural area or a suburban um, community. They also receive an education award, and so if you have a full-time member, they're going to have $5,800 at the end of their year of service that they can either apply to student loans that they have already um, incurred, or they can put it towards future education. If the member that you have recruited it happens to be over the age of 55, um, which again, I talked earlier about the KCK, they reach out to a lot of retired individuals to serve as their members. And if you're over the age of 55, you can then transfer that education award to another family member. So it's a great way perhaps for grandparents who might be retired um, to be earning education awards for their children or grandchildren. Full-time members would also have access to health insurance and childcare. Um, and then they would also be part of our network of AmeriCorps members, um, which we have found uh, collectively across the nation improves their likelihood of finding a job, getting a job, keeping a job, um, and being uh, employed in, a, in an area that really appeals to them. So there are a number of benefits that come to the AmeriCorps member. Now, this is not to say that running an AmeriCorps program is not a lot of work, because it is. This is a federal program, and we know that that doesn't come without a lot of strings and a lot of reporting and a lot of documentation, um, but it's a great way to receive money um, from the feds to operate a program that can really have a lot of impact in your community. As you can see here, our um, education um, organizations are eligible to be an applicant. And what we're offering right now, so our actual AmeriCorps application has closed, but we're offering a planning grant. Um, so if this is the first time you're ever hearing about AmeriCorps, a planning grant might be a great opportunity for you um, because it helps to prepare you for a full AmeriCorps program, possibly in the fall of 18. Um, you could request up to $30,000. This money could be used perhaps for a consultant. It could be used for some staff time to devote to this project. It could be used to collaborate with community partners, um, to attend training. Maybe there's some you know, behind the scenes infrastructure and networking that needs to be done. Um, and, and those things could come out of this planning grant. 
It doesn't include any AmeriCorps member. So all the great things I've been telling you have just been hyping you up to this moment where you might apply for a planning grant. Um, there is a match requirement, but you would be surprised. Most people get held up on the match and they think, oh gosh, 24% of 30,000, I, I can't match that. Um, but you really can. Um, by the time you've put in your own staff time, your own office time, your own office supplies, um, your your phone, um, any travel time that you put in, if you have substitutes, if you're if you're using teachers as part of the planning grant, um, it's really easy to get to the 24%. And this grant would go for 10 months, so it starts in August 1, which is when all of our AmeriCorps programs start. They can they can start August 1 or September 1, which is perfect for our school districts. And this planning grant will end at the end of May, which again is perfect for the school districts. Here you can see our application process. So the application is currently available. If you go to our website, which you'll see here in just a moment, um, you'll find it right on the home page on the right hand side. You'll also find in there more information about the planning grant. You'll find um, tips for submitting a successful planning grant. We actually held a webinar earlier on the planning grant. Um, it probably goes through much of this, but in much more detail about the application and about the budget. And so that will also be posted. Um, and those applications are due April 3rd. I know that is only 23 days away, but I promise you the application has a max of six pages and you can write six pages in 23 days. It, this application is um, not to be intimidating. It, it, we really are trying to have more applicants uh, for our AmeriCorps programs. There will be a clarification process that will take place, then a final grant review. It will go to the KVC for a vote. And because we're housed in the Department of Education, all of our grant opportunities then go to the State Board of Education for a vote. And then we will have final notification over the summer with the idea that you would start on August 1. So I invite you to explore this opportunity, explore the AmeriCorps program, and if it could be a good fit for your school or district or consortium or service center or any combination thereof. Um, you can email us if you want more information. You can email us if you want to be on our newsletter listserv so that you can receive all of our grant opportunities. And you can find this application and the resources on our website, www.canserve.org. Thank you very much.